Hi. Uh, so first off, I just want to say thank you to everyone who voted in the community vote. I was really humbled and uh, surprised by the response. So I guess a lot of you want to talk about money. So let's just uh, get started. So my name is Vladimir, and uh, I'm a freelancer. For the past 15 years, I've been doing all sorts of different stuff. So I started off, oddly enough, as a DJ. And uh, I played on a lot of music festivals and toured around the planet and had like an amazing time and met all, like, all sorts of crazy people. Eventually, I got a little bit more involved in the music industry. I released two CD compilations. I worked with some record labels and festival organizations doing stage management, production work, all sorts of crazy stuff. After a while, I decided to start my own uh, web design company. It's still going. It's been going for six years now. And uh, again, like I did all sorts of really cool projects for like some really unique clients and solved some really unique problems. And I've been having a lot of fun along the way. But I kind of also had an itch. I really like video games. And uh, I wanted to, to get in, in, into game development. So I started my own game dev company two years ago. It's called Zero Life. And uh, like it was like we just started like small, small projects, didn't have any idea where it was going. But eventually, we got some funding. And now we're working on two games. One is a 2D roguelike platformer. And the other is a game where you play as a crocodile who murders people and throws them around and then do, does all sorts of gruesome stuff. So the reason I'm telling you all of this is that basically like all of these different things that I've been doing for the past 15 years, they all had one thing in common, which is that I had to figure out a way to price them. So the title of my talk is Pricing Shouldn't Be Hard. And uh, well, for a lot of people, it presumably is. And I think that's the case because they don't ask a really, really simple question, like, what's the difference between a, a good deal and a bad deal? Like, you know, like what, when you walk into a store somewhere, you kind of can figure out what to buy and what not to buy. So let me give you an example. Like, I know nothing about cars, OK? So like, this is like the big car dealership thing. And like, I have a car which is 15 years old. It tends to break down every now and then. And I have to take it into the shop. And it used to be the case that I would take it to like one of these places, like the really big dealerships. And you'd drive the car around the back, they'd take it somewhere, they'd do something, and you would wait in the lobby for like, I don't know, an hour or whatever, and then they'd come back and they'd say, you know, yeah, we fixed the car, pay us this much, thank you, goodbye. And to me, it seemed like a shitty deal. Like, I never learned anything, I felt I was getting ripped off, like, it wasn't a good experience. So eventually, through a friend of a friend of a friend, I met like one of these guys, like the really cool car mechanic dude who just wanted to help solve my problems. And immediately, what would happen is, you know, he had like his own uh, garage in his backyard and everything, and I would take my hard car to his place. And, uh, you know, he'd tell me right away, like, look, I'm going to open the hood, come check this out, you know, you see this part here, it's broken, and I'm going to take it out, and I'm going to show you exactly the part which is broken, and it's going to cost you this much to replace it, and so on. And immediately, I felt more involved in the process. I felt like, you know, this guy he cares, you know, he's going to solve the problem for me, and he's not going to try and rip me off. He's going to explain exactly what the problem is, and I'm going to walk away feeling like, you know, I, I got something out of this. It was a good deal. So how do we become more like the cool, awesome car mechanic and less like the big evil company that's trying to rip you off? So I'm going to talk about a few things that helped me along the way. So the first thing I think you have to do is you have to track your time and expenses. So you have to figure out you know, what it is you want to do, how long it's going to take you to do these things, and so on. Now, when it comes to tracking, you can use any of these services. I don't think that's really the, the point. As long as you can figure out exactly what you want to sell and how much time it takes you to do that stuff, you're good. OK. So the second thing you have to do, you have to do the boring stuff, so like accounting. You know, like electricity bills and gas and like whatever other company costs you have, like uh, bookkeeping, accountants, and so on. Like if you're starting your own business, you need to know those numbers. Another thing is you're going to probably buy some software. We're all in the IT and we use all sorts of different stuff. You know, 
maybe maybe you need Photoshop, maybe maybe you paid for WinRAR, like I don't know, like maybe that's your thing. Like if you did, there's a subreddit for you, so congratulations. <laughs> now another thing is like maybe you'll get sick. Maybe you have to visit one of these places. Like you have to pay for healthcare. So again, if you're doing these things alone, which I did for a lot of uh, years, you have to kind of have a buffer. You have to think about this stuff, like for whatever reason, if you get stuck somewhere and you can't finish a job, you need to kind of be aware that you need a little bit of extra uh, every month. Another thing that I'm sure everyone here loves is taxes, hooray. So, you know, like at the end of the month, you have to pay this guy and really cool guy. So. Let's say that you figured all of this out, okay? So you know your monthly spend. You know exactly how much you have to earn on a monthly basis so that your business can keep going. Well, obviously, you should never go below that number, okay? So no matter what happens in a month, you always need to make more than what you're spending. And obviously, I think as well, which is important some people forget, you should always have a buffer, you know, for whatever unexpected problems may arise. Okay, so we figured all of that out. The next step is to write a proposal to the client. So you had one meeting or you talked with someone or whatever, and you have to write the proposal. Now, what influences the price of the proposal? Well, a lot of things, but first off, the client's budget, how much they're willing to pay for you, for whatever you're offering. Uh, the client risk, so a simple example is, let's say that you're doing a logo. It's not the same to do a logo for like a small flower shop around the corner or like a big bank. You know, there's much more work involved for a big corporation. So you have to, again, figure that out. Another thing is client knowledge. Is this someone who's going to micromanage you all the time? He's going to talk through every single step or is he going to be more hands off and let you do your thing? And in general, like how much does he know about the industry? This really influences uh, the, the, the offer that I'm actually writing. You have to kind of adapt to whatever it is the client knows or doesn't know. Obviously, the next thing is the deadline. You know, it's not the same if you have to do it next week or two or three months. And I think most importantly is your overall knowledge and experience. So if you've been doing something for five or 10 years or however long, you can probably price it a bit more than someone who's just starting out. So, this is the best question you can ask, right? If you get an answer to this question, I feel like you've done most of the work. If the client can actually come to you and tell you how much money they have for whatever it is they need, then everything you do from that point on is pretty much it's much more easier, basically. I've, in my case, like 90% of the time, if they tell me the number, I'm pretty sure I've sold, sold uh, uh, the proposal already. So we could probably talk about an hour to how to get the client to tell you their budget. I'm just gonna share a very simple, simple trick that I use. So instead of like going through all of their business information, all of the stuff they're working on and trying to ascertain how much money they make, which by the way, some of that information is publicly available, so you can find that out. But in the case that you can't and the client just says, ooh, like I, I can't tell you, like I don't know, it's confidential. What you can always do, you can define a range. You can say, you know, like this is the least amount that I'm comfortable working with, and this is the most amount. And you know, for this much money, you're gonna get as little as possible, and for this much money, you're gonna get all the bells and whistles and whatever. And you know, you can offer up more, more price points for whatever it is that, that you feel uh, could, be, could be good. Um, so how do I write a proposal? Well, I have a very simple proposal structure, just like in four parts. It tries to answer some very basic questions like why are we hiring, you know, why the client is hiring me, what it is they need, how we're going to do these things, and what the next steps for them are. Okay, so why? Uh, so this is an example from one of my PDF offers that I sent to clients. It's very, very simple. It's like, you know, my company info, their company info, and you know, hello, dear client, you're great, I love working with you, but you have a problem, and it's terrible, and you have to fix it, and so on, and you can even add some small graphs explaining your process. Next step is services and features. So what are you gonna do to help the client solve their problems? I've seen this done a million times. Please don't do this, okay? So don't just copy and paste whatever the client sends you 
or, or like just write big walls of text. Just apply the same logic. If you're a designer, you've been doing this stuff on the web for ages. So instead, do something like this. You know, just, just segment whatever features you're working on into small digestible chunks and add some nice visuals that they can, they can kind of easily process. And again, here's, here's one of my examples is like I just add some small icons and stuff. And again, short descriptions, short titles. I also color code stuff so it's, you know, it kind of seems like a whole thing. And if there's anything, uh, if there's ever something that you can uh, show off with a graph or whatever imagery, always put that. So for example, here, I just a simple content structure of a website. And again, another example, let's say you have some design stuff and you're supposed to do some templates, you know, just make a list of them, short descriptions of what they are. Pretty straightforward. Now let's move on to the pricing table that tries to answer the question how we're going to do this. So imagine this silly example, like no one in their right mind would pay for Netflix if they would, were supposed to pay like 50 cents per movie. That would induce so much anxiety. You would never want to watch stuff like this. At the end of the month, you'd always be thinking like, how many movies did I watch? You know, maybe, maybe just one more. I don't know. So the point I'm trying to make is there's an hourly rate and a fixed rate. Certain things work better for hourly rates. Certain things work better for fixed rates. So let's look at them. Let's look at some examples. Hourly rate. Consulting. So let's say you have some client that's super cool. You want to talk with him, but he kind of lets things go hands off. You're probably not going to charge him for 10 hours of consulting. Maybe he's happy with 30 minutes. Someone else, on the other hand, might want to bother you for hours and hours, and it makes sense to charge hourly. Things like maintenance, maybe the server breaks, you know, who knows, maybe you have to fix some really unique problem that you didn't see beforehand, so you have no way of understanding what's, how much it's going to cost. Content entry, now, I'll admit here, like, I'm horrible at writing import scripts and all that stuff, so I'm just like one of those people who copy-paste stuff into the database. <laughs> so, again, like, you know, that's one of those things you can't per uh, anticipate. So in general, I think it's things that you've never done before. So things that clients come to you with a unique problem, and maybe you're, you're specialized in that area. You solve unique problems all day. For you, I think in general, it makes sense to, to charge that stuff hourly. So let's look at flat rate. Things like logo design. You know, it's one of those things which sometimes it's really hard to put a value on something. And if you're really good at making logos, like let's say you just, it doesn't make sense to be punished if you spend five minutes creating a logo, but it took you 10 years to learn how to make that logo. Um, another thing are things like transport costs. So any like boring stuff that just has a fixed fee for whatever it is you're doing. A lot of people tend to forget to add this stuff to their offers. You know, just, just because you had to sit in your car and drive to another part of the city, like you should, you should get money for that as well. It's, it's your time. And software licenses, you know, things that just have a price attached to them that you have to use on a project. But in general, things you're an expert at. So something that you can brand, something that you can like put on a box with some checklists that say that you've done this stuff a lot of time and, and you can kind of sell yourself in that way. Maybe you've done a lot of case studies uh, on the topic and, and the client can see the value in that stuff. So let's look at like one simple pricing table example. The numbers aren't important. What's important is that you should use more options. You shouldn't just put one single hourly rate or, or just like one flat fee or whatever. Play around with the numbers because like it's not the same to charge hourly for like fixing some fires in a server room versus just copy pasting content. It, it, you, should, you should vary. And please, for the love of God, do the actual math. Like, uh, the numbers that are super rounded, like if the client tells you my budget is 2,000 euros, like don't quote, don't put 2,000 euros, it's, it's stupid. Like it makes you look like you didn't do actual number crunching and you didn't figure out how much time these things are gonna take. Another thing is if you're working for friends and family, Please, for the love of God, never lower your rates, okay? They're gonna, they're gonna bother you so much. They're gonna take up so much more of your time. So instead, just do one simple thing. Leave your numbers intact, okay? Just as if, as if it was a normal client, but instead, offer them a simple discount. You know, say that this is how much the whole project is gonna cost, but look, I'm offering you a really good deal and you're gonna get, you know, you're, you're gonna get a good thing because we're friends and family or whatever. 
So keep that in mind. So let's say we figured all of that stuff. What's the last, last thing the client, uh, the client needs? Okay, so you need to give them clear directions on how to proceed after you've given them all this information, you've kind of dumped everything on them. So add simple terms like a deadline and a contract, things that, you know, like you, have, you can make this in a certain amount of time for certain, under certain terms. And describe the timeline for moving ahead so let them know, like, in this week we're going to do this, in the next week we're going to do that, and, and so on. And ask them for stuff, whatever it is you need. Like, maybe you need their logos, maybe you need their branding materials, content, hosting access, whatever it is that you need from your end to proceed with uh, the project. And obviously give your contact info, like, <laughs> so they can, they can get back to you. Again, this is like how my template looks, very straightforward, just a couple of bullet points, what they need to do and my contact information in some terms. Okay, so let's do a quick recap. What have we learned? Track your time and expenses. Figure out what you wanna do, how long it's gonna take you to do these things, and like what your overall monthly spend is. Write a structured proposal, something that makes sense to the client, something that they can understand. Don't go overboard. I've seen people add like their awards that they've won and all sorts of stuff in the, in the, the proposals. I don't think it's necessary. If you wanna present yourself to, to the client and you feel you haven't done a good job at that, just make a separate PDF and send that and make the offer be more focused to, on, on the client themselves. Price it properly, like make sure that everything you're doing is, is, makes sense for the, the type of job you're doing and give clear directions to the client so they don't feel like, you know, maybe for a week or two they have no idea what to do after they got your, your proposal. And most importantly, like, care personally. Like, be more like the car mechanic and less like the really bad company. So, thank you. Let's, let's have some questions. Oh, um, you can download some of my templates. So I made a really, really simple boilerplate WordPress, uh, uh, sorry, Word document, which you can just download and use in whatever project you're using. So thanks. Wonderful job. Thank you. Thank Let's, you. I'm sure you have questions about this. A lot of great information here. Hi there. Great talk. Hi. Hi. So pricing shouldn't be hard, but I still didn't get the answer. How do I price myself based on my years of experience, job I'm doing, et cetera, et cetera? Sorry, sorry, can you repeat that? I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing you very well. Uh, uh, so pricing shouldn't be very hard, right? Yeah. But I didn't get the answer, how do I rate my time? Uh, how much money do I charge based on my experience, years I've worked on, and stuff like that? Okay, well, first of all, the, the, the single thing you have to figure out is what's the value of whatever it is you're doing to the client, and what is the risk involved? Now, again, you can, you can do it the long way, where you sit down with the client and you ask them like, okay, this job that we're doing together, um, what is the, for example, let's say it's, it's a website, like what percentage of your clients or what users or whatever are using that website? Okay, so after that, you ask another question, which is, you know, like, okay, how much, uh, how much of a revenue stream is this to your company? How important is it is? So basically, you have to ask a lot of questions to the client to try and figure out how, how big the company is, how big of a risk it is to the company. It's a very long process that I probably can't put in 25 minutes, which is why I have another example, is just pick a range that you're comfortable with. Now, what you can do as well is you can look up online and see how, other, how much other people in the industry are making, but you have to be very careful when looking at those numbers because, again, it doesn't account for your experience versus their experience and so on. But it, it could be a good starting point. But another thing is, again, like I mentioned earlier, never go below the number that you're comfortable with on, on just covering your monthly expenses. So like whatever it is you're doing, you should never go below that and then add buffers accordingly. But yeah, if, if, if you want, we can have a longer conversation about how to talk to clients. Uh, actually, Nella did a talk two years ago here at WebCamp talking about how to solve particular problems with clients uh, from a design perspective as well. So you should check that out. Thank you. Quick reminder, if you're leaving early, please try to be as quiet as possible. It's still disruptive. Great talk, Vladimir. Thank you. Uh, question, you have long-term clients, for example, and you decided to raise your prices along the way. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you tell the, the clients? Do you lose the client or 
like do you give them a discount or something? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, that can be very difficult. I mean, one of the things you could do, obviously you can explain whatever value you're gonna add. So let's say that you've gained a lot of experience in the last couple of years, and you can present that as a separate thing that you're kind of tacking on. So for example, I had this problem where I was doing a lot of maintenance stuff on just like a single website and everything. And so it's, it's been done on, on an ongoing process and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what else I can add. So instead of saying like, you know, you know from now on, the maintenance is gonna cost you this much, you say, look, I'm gonna include all of this other extra stuff and because I'm doing all of that, I'm increasing the value of my work and therefore, you know, it's worth it for you to pay more. Uh, hello, great talk. Hi. Um, I was wondering uh, why do you prefer a flat flat rate for things you're good at? Because not every logo or whatever would take the same amount of time. Yeah. So that's that's a really good question. I don't actually prefer flat rate for logo, but for logos in particular, there's one thing that's, that you can do that's really cool and unique. So what you can do is you can tell the client, I'm gonna make you, let's say, five versions of, lo of one like idea and it's gonna like, take whatever time you need, like it's a flat fee, that's how much it costs. Then, let's say the client isn't happy. Let's say they wanna micromanage you. Well, it's very simple for you to say, this is what I've made, you can either accept it, or if you wanna sit down next to me and like, tweak the numbers and everything, I'm gonna charge you an hourly rate, and it's gonna cost you this much to change anything. So that's one way to do it. Another way is, like, you can make a logo and you can say that logo costs whatever. Or you can talk with the client about their business and you can spend hours and hours trying to figure out what their branding strategy is, like how they want to present themselves on the market, who their target audience is, all of this stuff. And that increases so much more in value to the client that I couldn't really put a, uh, an hourly rate on that stuff. And again, it really depends. Are you doing it for a bank, you know, who has to print logos on you know, airplanes or whatever? Or is it just something that you're doing for a really, really small shop? So the prices have to vary. And I, I feel at least that it's a bit too hard to put an hourly rate on that. But again, you can mix and match these things. As long as the client is aware, I think you're good. So yeah, thank you. Hey, great talk. Um, so based on the list of points that where, where you decide on your price, you know, the deadline, the specifications type of work, what about the, mar the competition on the market and their prices? Should you just ignore them or take them into account? What, what do you think? I really don't care how anyone, anyone else is charging. I really don't care. Like, I have a fee that I want to, that satisfies myself and my business. That's it. Like, I don't want to make 100 websites in a year. I want to make five or six. I want them to be really good and I've calculated how much I have to make in a year so that it makes sense for my business. That's it. Like, maybe some of you are charging less, maybe you're charging more. The point is that I'm not comparing myself to anyone else. I'm telling the client about what my value is and what I'm offering to them. So that's it, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>